Well, I can't get it to push down. Oh. Oh, I was a, yeah, yeah. I was trying to push the light. That's about the way I do things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they talk about the. Uh, I don't know what it is. I probably couldn't pronounce it if I did. But uh, they say there's something in Turkey when you eat it, it puts you to sleep. I don't know what that is. But if I eat anything much, it puts me to sleep. Uh, I guess that's because I'm like a hog. I don't know. But uh, we, uh, I trust you had a good Thanksgiving with family and friends. And uh, it's good to be uh, a thankful people. The Bible commands us to be thankful. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18 says, in everything, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks. Uh, sometimes that might seem like that's an easy job, but uh, sometimes it's not. To give thanks in the middle of pain or problems or disease or sickness, uh, sometimes that's not an easy chore. But I believe the Lord is honored by it. And we'll certainly be blessed by doing that as well. I uh, appreciate the privilege to come back and be here. I don't remember how long it's been. Brother Burrow, when he was here, I came and preached. Uh, it's been probably three or four years, I guess. It's hard for me to keep up with time, too. But uh, I, uh, I think when I think about... Uh, Getting old, and I am. I miss uh, I miss a lot of things that I used to take for granted. Uh, I miss my energy. The older I get, uh, it don't take near as much to do me as it used to. I used to could work night and day about it. I did, but uh, a lot of the times, work two and three jobs. But uh, I miss that energy. Another thing I miss, I miss my ears. I can't hear good no more. My wife says I uh, sort of selective here, and she calls it. Uh, I don't hear her hardly at all, she says. Uh, <laughs> I miss my eyes. Lord have mercy. I tell you, I used to have perfect vision out yonder, up close. It didn't make any difference. Then it got to where I had to be, where I had good light. If I had good light, I could see good. Now it don't make any difference if it's if I got much light, like in the nighttime. I I drove a truck for, God, twenty years or better. Uh, drove for GWP, drove for Danny Goods, drove for Joe and Bergen Silvers for fifteen years. I drove more at night than I did of day. It didn't bother me. I'd rather because the traffic wasn't as bad. But uh, when you get as old as I am, that light goes to bothering you. The glare and uh, the reflections off of everything bothers you. Uh, the, I went. And I have to have my eyes checked pretty often. I'm a diabetic, and they want me to check them. Go have a diabetic check every year. And uh, I don't think yet, I don't think I've got Cadillacs. Mines are just Pontiacs, I think. But uh, I guess, uh, did any, does anybody here know Tommy McIntosh Hub? He, uh, I drove truck with him for, Lord have mercy, years. And uh, he used to have a, a, a sign, a license plate sign on the front of his truck that said, of all the things I've lost, I miss my mind the most. And that's about to where I am now. But uh, I tell you, I'm thinking about uh, losing your mind. Uh, I've got so bad anymore I get up and I take so many pills. I used to didn't take an aspirin for nothing. I, I bet till I was... 
15 years ago, I didn't take a handful of headache medicine my whole life. But uh, now I've got my mind is in such foul shape. I get up of a morning and I have to stop and think. Now, am I going to the kitchen to take my medicine or have I already took it? And uh, I tell you, you get in a shape like that, you're afraid to do or not to do. But uh, I'm glad uh, to be here with you all again tonight here at Zion. Uh, most of you know I work at Hawkins Brothers. I've been there over eight years now. And uh, we've had funerals all up and down, upper and lower pig pen, all around here. Uh, we've had funerals for the folk in this area. Uh, so I know a lot of y'all from being involved with the funeral service. Uh, we, if you'll come up and see us, we'll try to treat you good and uh, try to be the last to let you down. And uh, I want you to take your Bible and look with me to James chapter number four. I like the book of James. Uh, there's a lot of preachers, theologians, people of knowledge, and just ordinary people. A lot of people don't think much of the book of James. Uh, they think it's uh, not applicable to life. But I think... It is one of the most practical books in the New Testament. It gets down, I remember J. Vernon McGee. I used to listen to him on my lunch hours. And he used to say that James, well, he used this phrase, but he said uh, it's, it's the kind of book that gets down where the rubber meets the road. Uh, it's where we live. And I look, as I look at uh, chapter number four, he, he makes some tremendous statements in this book, in chapter 4. Uh, I like how he deals with the subject of prayer. Uh, he just simply said, a lot of us, we have not, because we didn't even simply bother to ask. Or some of us, we have asked, but we ask in the wrong way. We ask for the wrong purpose. We ask amiss. Uh, in verse number three. And uh, some of us ask for the wrong reasons. In the last part of verse three, that you may consume it upon your lusts. Uh, we ask selfishly to, to help us, nobody else, but just for our benefit. Uh, and I, then down in verse seven and eight, I I like this passage. Submit yourself in verse 7, therefore to God, resist the devil. Now you have to uh, abide by that first part. Submit ourselves therefore to God. Then we can resist the devil and he will flee from you. Then in verse number 8, I've claimed this verse I don't know at the times, probably as much as any other passage in the book of James. Draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. That gives us hope and encouragement, even in a service like this tonight, that if we'll take the time and the effort to draw close and nigh to him, that he'll draw nigh to us. Oh, what a promise. But I, I'm interested tonight. It seemed like the Lord put on my heart this evening when the, your pastor asked me if I'd sort of help him, he didn't know if he'd get back after that funeral in time, and he wanted me to sort of stand in the gap and help him in case he didn't. But uh, my mind went, and it's been on all evening, this passage here in uh, verse number 13 and following here in chapter number 4. Go to now, or we would say, come on now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. And then this tremendous question, for what is your life? 
What is your life? Some people, you ask them about the way they're living. Or are they living for the Lord? Well, I used to. I don't go to church much. I don't do this. I don't do that. But now I know what you're talking about. Uh, he says, what is? Present tense, right now. Not everybody else's life, your neighbor's life, but what is your life? Boy, what a question. What is your life? What God's given you? You see, if you go back in the first book of the Bible, you'll find that it was God that put breath and life into a man, into a human being. And so with that life that if we're saved, we have uh, had a, a new birth and new life. And so the question is, what, what are we doing with that life? What kind of life are we using every day? Boy, what a question. And then he gives us this description of the kind of life that we have. He said, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. You see, it's Him. It's the Lord that controls our lives. You see, I've, I knew, I knew a man in my hometown. My wife was from Saluda, North Carolina. And there was an old boy. I knew him well. And I didn't think he was in that bad a shape. But one Sunday evening, he walked out on Main Street took a pistol, and tried to shoot his brains out. But the problem was it didn't kill him. And his side of his head was sunk in, and he lived a life for a lot of years after that, but he wasn't at himself anymore. He thought he could end it. He thought he could take his life. But you see... We don't control our own life. It's God that gives us the next breath, the next heartbeat. It's God that can give or take away our life. That's the reason why he says here, for you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now he said, you rejoice and your rejoicing, and your boastings, all such rejoicing and bragging as this is evil. For we're not in charge of everything in our lives. We may think we are, but we're not. And then he closes out with verse number 17. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it's sin. If I was to ask you, what is your biggest sin? Or what is my biggest sin? I, everybody maybe would have a different answer. But you see, it's a lot of people have the idea that their sins are what they do wrong. And a lot of times that's true. But that's not, a lot of times, our worst sin. Our worst sin, many times, is not the sin of commission but rather the sin of omission. What we omit to do. What we know we should do, but we don't get around to doing it. We don't think it's important enough. And uh, I tell you, there's a lot in these verses right here, but I just want to focus back on that verse number 14. For what is your life? Let me give you three words to think about as we think about our lives. And I think that James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us about these three things out of these verses. Number one, he mentions the duration of our lives. 
He said, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. Some people say that it's the picture of steam coming out of a tea kettle. Rises a little above the tea kettle, and then it just, like it vaporizes, it goes away. I think another good illustration of that statement, that word vapor, would be what we're familiar with here in the fall of the year, the early morning fog and mist. Well, we had a bunch of them this year. Uh, but you see, that's an interesting thing when you think about it. It's not easy to deal with all the time. I, I tell you, I've had to drive in fog that was so thick, you couldn't hardly see the front of your vehicle. You couldn't, if it hadn't been for the white lines and the lines on the road, you couldn't have seen anything. It was dangerous, terrible. But uh, the fog, the morning mist, it's interesting the more you think about it. You see, the mist is just little droplets of water that has, has changed form and has become, and it's visible to us. We can see it. And then as the sun gets up and it gets warmer and the sun begins to burn that fog off, what it does, it, it hasn't removed the fog. It hadn't blowed it out. The fog is still here. It just changes forms back to the invisible. It changes from a liquid back to a gas, technically. Now, I want to tell you something. When you think about that, that's a pretty good description of our lives. Uh, when a person dies, it's not that they're gone forever, never to be seen or heard of again. A believer, when they die, they go to another place, another home. They're living after death. You say, preacher, you don't know that. I've heard that all my life. I want to tell you, that's the Bible. It is appointed unto men once to die. And some people say, well, when you die, that's it. It's curtains. It's all over. That's the end of the show. No, it isn't. You see, God tells us that even after we die, there is another day. And there is another reason that we ought to live right for the Lord now. It's because once we die, we're going to have to, every one of us, stand before the Lord in judgment. Every one of us, Romans tells us, must give account of himself to the Lord. We're all going to face God. Now, I'm glad we don't have to stand before our neighbors or before each other. I'm glad that when we stand in judgment, it's going to be before him that knows all of us and knows all about us. I mean, he knows the hairs on our head. I tell you, I'm glad that God's the one doing the judging, the Lord and not us. But he says this, this life that we live now, it's, it's not here to stay. This life, this physical fleshly life is not an everlasting life. Some people act like it is. They live like it is. But God didn't put us here to live forever. It's, this is just, the, the old Puritans used to say, this is just the dressing room to prepare, to prepare for the main act. This is where we get ready to go to our long home, they called it. To where we really are going to live forever. And so he said, this life is just like a vapor. It appeareth for a little time, just like a vapor. You know, I remember my granddad on my dad's side lived to be in his early 90s, 92 or 4. And I, the last time I saw him, I went home. I was born and raised in the western part of Maryland. As far west and north as you can go in Maryland, that's where I grew up. And I came to North Carolina to go to school and got married. And 
I tell people she just won't let me go back home. But uh, really, uh, I uh, remember seeing my granddad. We all called him Pop. And I went to see him. And I sat down with him at his dining room table. And we were just talking about life in general. I said, Pop, let me ask you a question. I said, to me, I don't know how old I was at that time. A lot younger than I am now. And I said, uh, for me to think about a person living to be 90 plus years old seems like almost an eternity. Does it seem like you've lived a long life? And he didn't have to st study or think about it much. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, I remember back when I was a teenage boy. And it seems like it was just yesterday. Just a day or so ago. And uh, I, I never have forgot that. But that's what James is trying to tell us here. Our life in this world, in the present tense, it's just like a vapor. You can see it. You might even touch the effects of it now, but it ain't here to stay. It's going to disappear one of these days from this world. And that doesn't mean that it's going never to be remembered of or uh, mentioned again. It's just that this physical life that we have now is going to change forms. We're going to live in a different body. We're going to live in a different world, in a different country. So he mentions, first of all, the duration of that life. What is your life? James says it's, it's awful short. I could say that. I'm, I'm going on in a month or two, I'll be 71. And I can tell you, I, it doesn't seem like I've lived this long. 71 years? I remember when I thought that was old. It don't seem near as old as it used to. But he mentions, first of all, the duration of life. Then I think in verse number 13, he mentions the danger of our lives, living our lives. He said, now, listen to me. You ought to say today or tomorrow, we will go to a certain city. We'll continue there a year. We'll buy, we'll sell, we'll trade. And the main thing in this world of this, this hour is to make money, to get gain. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those things he mentions in verse number 13. But the danger is that we get so caught up living, buying, selling, trading, making a profit that we forget the important thing, what we're really here for. Uh, God didn't put us in this world, and He didn't save us to be a savvy business person. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to tell you, that's not the most important thing. And he's, that's the reason why He says, uh, this man in verse 13, He had a lot of good plans. He had, a, he, he had his plan worked out. Uh, I will go into such a city. He had in his mind made up which, where he was going. My brother, my older brother, came to North Carolina while I was still in high school. And uh, people got to asking, well, are you going to move south like he did? Well, at that time... My wife said, you was just a purebred Yankee. But I didn't, I didn't have anything against the South. I just didn't have any desire to move down here until I got here. And I met that little brown-haired gal, and uh, she fell in love with me and twisted my arm and made me marry her. And uh, going back home and back north wasn't an option. But this dude, he had his plan made. I'm going to such and such a city. And he said, I'm, the, I'm going for a certain period of time. I'm going to, you know, endeavor to try my hands at uh, 
business in that city. And I'm going to try to be productive and make money in that city. And his purpose in going was buy, sell, and get gain, make money. Again, nothing wrong with any of those things. But uh, he tells us here that uh, we might ought to consider the most important thing. Verse 15, for you ought to say, if the Lord will, we'll live and do this or that. You see, this man in verse 13, he didn't inquire of the Lord whether he ought to move to another city or another state or to change jobs. He didn't ask the Lord about his will, about uh, what he did with his life. And that's the reason why it's so important. He said, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. Uh, the emphasis of our day today is on the temporal. This world is so caught up in living, we don't have time for the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, there's been a lot of changes. I had a preacher, I was, he and I were preaching a funeral in one of my first churches out in Hendersonville. And uh, he wanted to ride to the funeral or to the uh, graveyard with me. And as we got in the car and in procession started to the graveyard, he looked over at me and he said, man, you're a young fella. He said, how long you been preaching? And I told him it was like 10 years, something like that. He said, can you see much difference in trying to pastor a church today as when you started? I said, yes, I sure can. At that time, he'd been preaching 40-some years. Good evangelist. He preached a lot of meetings out in that area. Good pastor. He's, I said, uh, I know you have. He said, you know, it's hard to describe the difference that he is involved in being a pastor now as it did 40 years ago. Uh, I said, what's the difference? How would you explain the difference? He said, well, when I was a young man, started preaching, the main thing, the most important thing the church wanted me to do was to get along with God, get a word from heaven, and preach the Bible. He said, now, that's way down the list of what churches are looking for in a pastor. They want a man that's a jack of all trades. They want a man that's a counselor. That's a ball coach. They want a man that's a socializer. That's a host of parties. And if it comes handy, can do a little, a little preaching. And I thought about, you know, boy, he, he hit the nail on the head. And it hasn't gotten any better. Now I've, I've been preaching over 50, almost 52 years. And I want to tell you, it sure changed in my ministry since I started preaching. The emphasis is upon verse 13, on the temporal, on the physical. So little is placed upon the spiritual. We're not interested in the spiritual in this hour. In our country, I hate to say, but uh, used to be that the church and uh, the church in the community the church was the hub of the community. I mean, the people in the community, they looked to the church for direction. They looked to the people of the church to show them how to live and what to do. But uh, the, we've, we've got everything turned around backwards. And we need to place uh, the emphasis upon the will of the Lord. I tell you, it's been a long time since I've had a young man, a young woman, a young couple say, you know, we'd like for you to marry us or I want you to pray for us. We're getting ready to move. And I'd be inquire of them a little bit and ask them some questions. And it's rare that you find a couple that say, you know, we prayed about it and we feel like it's the Lord's will. 
And I want to tell you, that's the most important thing. That we marry in the Lord's will. That we work a job that uh, is the Lord's will for us to work in. Uh, that's the most important thing. If it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. So he, dis he mentions here not only the, the duration of our lives, it's, it's like a vapor. It's brief. It's short. He mentions the danger of our lives that we might get caught up in living life that we get so caught up and busy doing that that we forget the most important thing, and that's the will of the Lord. Then in verse number 15, I think he also shows us the duty of our life. The duty. The, da the danger is that we live our lives doing what we want to do, how we want to do, where we want to do, as long as we plan to do. The book of Ecclesiastes, old Solomon, David's son, he, uh, ever, a lot of people call him the wisest man. I don't know about that. Any man that thinks he needs 300 wives and 700 concubines, in my opinion, he ain't too smart. But he sought in his life to find happiness and peace. He looked in every way, every channel of life that it has to offer. And it seemed like every road that he went down he ended up saying, ah, that's vanity, vanity. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. It's not in work. It is not in things. It's not in doing, uh, seeking different of the opposite sex. It's not in any of those things uh, that he describes in the book of Ecclesiastes. But he mentions here, in the Ecclesiastes 12, the last chapter, he said, Now, remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I don't have any pleasure in them. And I want to tell you, I still have some pleasures. But this getting old, it ain't what I expected it to be. My golden years has tarnished. And he's telling us here that we need to, uh, in all the things we pursue, and all the things that we live for, he, he closes out in the last two verses of the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes. He said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What is the... Ball man's life down to the conclusion and the climax of his life. What is the purpose of life? He said, here it is. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why is that so important, Solomon? For God, he says in the last verse, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In other words, Solomon is simply saying, this life, when it's over, that's not the end. We're still going to have to give account to God. And we need to realize that is a duty of our life that God's given us, all of us. Every one of us, Romans, Paul said in Romans, must give account of himself to God. That's our duty. That's our responsibility. You say, I don't believe in that. That don't change the fact. That doesn't change the fact of whether you believe it or not. You're still going to be there. We're still going to have to stand before God. Of every work, everything that we do. You know, 
when you think about life and what God's done for us, we were talking about Thanksgiving and she sang about being thankful. Uh, you know, all of the things that God's given us. I like that old song we used to sing when I was a kid. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God hath done. I tell you, if we begin to count how many things God's done for us, they're, in, they're innumerable. We, could, we wouldn't have time to find fault or to fuss or to feud or do anything like that if we just take time to count our blessings. And the Bible says that uh, we need to say, what's the Lord's will? What, what's His pleasure? Because we're going to have to stand before Him one day. I want to tell you something. If you don't remember nothing else I say tonight, remember this. Jesus Christ is not the best way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. That's the reason why in John 14, Jesus was talking to His disciples in the shadow of the cross. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. Well, I tell you, that would, uh, that would solve a lot of problems for people in this hour. A lot of religions have their ideas of the, the way to get to God, the way to get God's attention. A lot, of, a lot of religions have the idea that God's mad and angry at everything and everybody and we've got to do something to keep God from being mad at us. But this Bible tells me that God loves us. He loves us so much that in that while we were yet sinners, God sent His Son into this world to die for us. What a price. I've got two girls. The oldest one is, gosh, he's about 50 years old now. And I tell you, there's never been a day that I would give my life of either one of my daughters for anybody. I wouldn't do it. But I tell you, when I try to think of how much God loved us, that he gave us his only begotten son, it's beyond my comprehension. I can't, I can't grasp that. But that's how much He loves us. He loves us tonight. Whatever we've done, good or bad, He still loves us. And the thing that amazes me is, He loves me. Now, I could understand some of you folk, Him loving you. But when I think of me, and how sorry I am at times, I don't understand how He loves me. But the thing that really blesses me is there's nothing I can do to make God love me any less. He loves me. He loves me. Oh, He loves me. I'm so thankful that He does. I want you to stand with me if you would. I want you to think about and Keep that verse in your mind. What is your life? And let that sink into your heart. And then remember the duration of our lives here, the danger of our lives, and the duty of our lives. Father, we just want to pause to thank you for the Lord Jesus that came into this world to pay the price of our redemption, to pay the price of our salvation, to pay a price that we could not pay, that He was willing to come and pay that price for us. I pray that You'd help us to live our lives like we'll be thankful and grateful that we have lived when we stand before You in judgment. Touch every heart and home. 
that's come and represented here tonight, I pray that you'd help us to live for you in such a way that this church and our individual lives will be a light to a dark world. And we'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' lovely name. Amen.